This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Catherine Druckmann and Jonathan Bennett together talk with me to one of the most important people in all of Linux, Greg Croa Hartman. He's an alpha maintainer of so many things inside the kernel, and he talks about it's just a fabulous show, and it goes fast. Even if it takes an hour, it'll go faster than that because this is a great show, and that is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 706, recorded Wednesday, November 9th, 2022. Secrets of the Linux Kernel. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Code Comments, an original podcast from Red Hat that lets you listen in on two experienced technologists as they describe their building process and what they've learned from their experiences. Search for Code Comments in your podcast player. And by Collide. Collide is an endpoint security solution that gives IT teams a single dashboard for all your devices regardless of their operating system. Visit collide.com slash floss to learn more and activate a free 14-day trial today. No credit card required. Good morning, good evening, good whenever it is, wherever you are. I am Doc Searles, and this is Floss Weekly. I am joined this week by both (laughs) Catherine Druckmann and Jonathan Bennett, who we pulled in here at the last minute (laughs) because we've been talking so much together on about, about our guest, about, about Greg Crow Hartman, who's on the, who's on the show today. So um, I want to get into it, but any quick words from either of you about how, how you, how you prep for this, what, what made sense to you about it? Why it's so important for you guys to be on the show. I was going to say, I was excited about the interview, but it was a lazy morning for me. And, uh, you know, I was kind of getting ready to run to the post office, but I hadn't done everything. And then about five minutes before the show, Doc says, hey, why don't you come on? It's like, well, I really have to scramble. The, the, the camera's over here instead of over there and just nothing's ready. I haven't done my hair or anything. And Doc's like, no, no, you're on with this. Start scrambling. It's like, okay, fine. Get everything in place and sit down and look. And it's like, oh my goodness, I've got the Einstein hair going on. If you're not watching the video, you're really missing out. If you are watching the video, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so people may not know who only listen. Uh, Jonathan has serious hair. He has the hair that yeah. that I envy. I had when I was like five. You know. <laughs> so Catherine, there you're still in uh, Houston. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I'm still here. I'm very excited to talk to Greg for a lot of reasons. You know, we're going to nerd out about the Linux kernel, but also the three of us have Linux Journal in common, which is kind of fun. And really, I'm excited to be here because of Jonathan's hair. I've got to be honest. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> I mean, the Linux is cool too. You know, but, but he, sl- he slicks it back. He's not so hot. It's just. It's- <laughs> okay. Well, I, I want to get into it, so I want to let everybody know here that. Um, our guest, Greg Crow Hartman, um, uh, is a fellow of the Linux Foundation. Uh, he's currently responsible for the stable Linux kernel releases and is a maintainer of the USB TTY and driver core subsystems in the kernel, as well as other portions of the code base that he wishes he could forget about, he says. He's the author of two books about Linux kernel development, both free online and has, many, has written many papers and articles about the Linux kernel. Um, I, wait, the main thing is he's important. <laughs> Your Linux depends on this yes. guy. So, <laughs> so, so no welcome pressure. to the show, Craig. Uh, thanks <laughs> there for you having are. me. It's great to be here. <laughs> and and you are in, so, so we're in uh, California, Oklahoma, and, and Texas, and you're in the Netherlands. So yes, it's late I'm in the, the day, Late in the day for you. Yep. Great. What, what, what brought you there? I've, I mean, I asked this in the pre-show, but. Um, I moved to Paris a couple six years ago uh, to work with one of the universities there. Um, they have a really good research team um, that do a lot of open source work, uh, really good tools and system design stuff. And um, it was a chance to go and work with them. They, uh, um, I say one of the people there, Julia Lule, who's created some tools that we use for static analysis and security stuff has fixed more security bugs in the kernel than anybody else because she's fixed them all and then prevented them from ever coming back in, which is great work. And then I was living there for a couple of years and um, my daughter got into medical school in the Netherlands and my son wanted to go to high school in one one place for four years. And then he got into a really good school in The Hague. Uh, so we're 
there. And now we've been here ever since. And now my son's in the university in Amsterdam. So it's a good place. Well, and so did you speak any Dutch before you went there? I did not. No, I am learning Dutch. I am doing very badly. <laughs> um, <laughs> Corona took a big hit on that because you didn't speak to anybody. Uh, my daughter is now fluent. My son has had a couple of years. He's pretty good. Um, my wife and I are, my wife is better than me. I'm still learning. It's hard when you work from home, you don't see anybody. And 95% of the people here speak English. The second most common, like, let's, say, let's see, England is the next comp- country, 98%. Um, so everybody knows English. If you try and speak Dutch to somebody, they'll just switch to English because they want to get the job done and move on. Um, so and, it's a little bit hard. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and worse, and I found this in Denmark too. I don't know why, not in other Scandinavian countries, but in Denmark and, and in, in the Netherlands, is that you'll be talking to somebody and you'll think they're from the US and they're not, they're native Dutch people, <laughs> but they speak perfect, unaccented. Or, they would, or perfect they're, uh, they're, they've learned it from British TV. We found out a lot. So there's a lot of people with heavy British accents because they learned from British TV. Uh, it depends um, on what TV so, you watch. <laughs> yeah, it depends on what TV you watch growing up as a kid. But the Dutch actually are really good. And I live in The Hague, which is only 40% Dutch because of all the international here. There's all the embassies for all the countries yeah. here and um, lots of nonprofits. And so it's a really, really good multicultural area to live in. So we're happy. So, so how'd you get into the Linux kernel? I mean, you've been, I, I, as long as I can remember, but I have a feeling it doesn't go all the way back. So when, when did you pick that up and why, and how do you get stuck? <laughs> I had been, I had used it at a job a long, long time ago when it first came out, uh, when Oracle first worked on it. Uh, we did it as we did a system. I did embedded programming. And then a couple jobs later, I was doing um, USB devices. I was writing firmware for USB barcode scanners. And I had to plug my device into all different operating systems to verify it. I plugged it into Linux and it came up instead of a, mouse, a keyboard, it showed up as a 128 key mouse. So that was my fault, not Linux's fault. <laughs> um, Windows handled it fine, which is funny. Um, and then I started contributing because I saw, hey, we can contribute this. Uh, I can write, write some code for this. And then my wife, um, when I t- took our new newborn daughter and went on vacation to visit some family for a weekend, she said, go write that driver you've been talking about all the time. So I spent a weekend, <laughs> wrote a driver for a device I had, and I submitted it and sent it to the mailing list. And it was like, instantly, it was like, oh, no, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. And oh, have you ever heard of SMP, multiprocessors? I'm like, what? <laughs> um, and I'm like, this is awesome. This is a great way to learn. This is a great uh, environment. Um, technically, it was wonderful. And I learned so much. And then over time, more people were using this code I had written for free in the USB stack than anything that I got paid for. My company was that I worked at was okay, but they weren't doing that well. And I got a job doing Linux full time, I think, in '99 or 2000, and I've been doing it full time ever since. So, speaking of that, um, and we're going to ask some really juicy, nerdy questions pretty soon. But, but I have this kind of burning one, and and it's, um, I wonder, you know, remember back to those days when you first started working with Linux and back when you were writing for Linux Journal, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we were still convincing the world that Linux and open source was viable and legitimate. Um, and now the entire world and, and beyond our world uh, depends on Linux. Do you ever just pause for a sec and let that kind of blow your mind? And, and how do you deal with the pressure of that? As Doc mentioned in the, in the beginning, this is you're, you're very important now. How, how does that work? <laughs> It's totally scary. I mean, we used to joke, total world domination is our goal, but it yeah. wasn't really a joke. <laughs> um, it, it's kind of funny. I mean, about the decade ago, we kind of realized we were, we beat everybody else. Um, about 10, 15 years ago, we had implemented everything else everybody else had done. In fact, we implemented stuff that people had never done. We were just implementing stuff off of marketing bulletins, and there's a fun story about that. But um, so we were way ahead of everybody else. So then I had, I had even talked to Microsoft and Apple, and they're like, yeah, we're never going to catch up. Have fun. Um, so it's just <laughs> it's actually hard coming up with new things. It's easy to copy stuff. Um, but yeah, it's kind of weird. Um, but yeah, we're everywhere. We're like in my washing machine. We're yeah, um, all over the everywhere. house. <laughs> yes, everywhere, all over the house. Um, all over, crazy. Out, out, off of the planet as well, right? Yeah, uh, phones. I mean, Android phones was at four or five billion devices. Linux on servers is a rounding error compared to Android. So <laughs> it's like everybody forgets that. So um, yeah, we're, we took over pretty much every market. I keep joking. What's the next market we need to take over? Um, we just took over medical pretty much. I think we're, I think that's pretty much in the bag. Um, 
But after that, yeah, what, let's see what else is next. I mean, telco was the first big one that put us on the map and it was like, okay, this is, this is real. We can actually, Linux can be used for real things. And we went from there. Yeah, I feel like I, increasingly though, I feel like I, I find myself answering that question again. And I wonder if that's your experience too. We're like, di didn't we have this conversation 15 years ago? And yet again, I think maybe because of some recent security concerns or something, um, I, I find people asking, questioning and being skeptical about open source. And, uh, you know, I hear the problem with open source or, um, you know, something like that. Or there's still this misperception that, uh, open source is for hobbyists and, and ends up with abandoned repos. Do you, do you get that a little bit or are you still very much in your open source bubble? I feel like I am, but every time I leave it, I, I run into these questions and I, it always, I get a little deja vu. Yeah, it's deja vu. It's there. I mean, I used to joke we needed a marketing department and then we got one with the Linux Foundation and that's pretty much went away. Um, but I mean, all Linux is, is a tool that other people can use to solve their problem, right? Nobody's forcing you to use Linux. So people are picking up and using Linux because it solves a problem for them. And we're creating Linux and we're contributing to Linux because it solves a problem for us. So, I mean, from a technical point of view, this is pretty, um, we're not pushing anybody to do anything. We're not forcing anybody to do anything. So they're choosing it of their own free will. They're using it of their own free will because it solves a problem for them. And that's good. I want, I want to solve a problem for somebody else. Um, I mean, cow milking machines and satellites and helicopters on Mars. I mean, yeah. and I'll, um, mega, super mega yacht balancing things so they don't tip over. I mean, that's all running Linux. It's crazy. <laughs> um, but nobody likes writing operating systems and device support. We support all the devices in the world and then some. And that's the key. The fact that we support all the hardware that you have is what made Linux succeed. Uh, it's what stops other operating systems. Everybody forgets about it. It's easy to write a kernel. It's hard to write. 50,000 drivers. So, <laughs> so yeah, well, you, you have this list of places you want to take over. Uh, has the desktop made the list? You know, the, the joke for the longest time has been the year of the Linux desktop. And I mean, I, I've kind of told people, no, it's been the year of the Linux desktop for me since like 2003. Um, but what's the deal? <laughs> it was a Linux, yeah, Linux desktop for me since 1999. Um, we did and nobody noticed. Chrome OS, number one selling laptop in the top 10 the past 10, no, maybe not 10 years, eight years, nine years, 10 years, that's all Linux. Mm -hmm. We won, you know, that's Linux on the <laughs> desktop. Um, we had Linux, I mean, on the phone, it's more devices out there than any other phone out there. It's Linux on the desktop and we won there. Um, you want traditional Linux on a desktop. Um, I mean, we won with that as well. If vendors want it, I mean, Red Hat makes a very good business selling Linux on the desktop for workstations. It's all of Hollywood and all the rendering farms and um, other companies do it. HP sells Linux on all their laptops that they sell to businesses. Um, Ford, infamously, entire Ford engineering division is all running Linux and then they have Windows in the car. So <laughs> that was the funny one. Um, I think they finally got Windows out of the car. Um, but so, I mean, it's on the desktop if you want it. And that's about it. I mean... You have to want it and you have to have a company that wants to sell it. I, it when I was working at Novell, we sold Linux pre-installed on lots of machines if people wanted it. And it was possible to do. Canonical still does it. I bought Dell laptops with Ubuntu on it and it works. Mm -hmm. It's there. Uh, yeah. So speaking of the desktop, there is a, I, I think I'm allowed to get into some nerdier stories now. Uh, there's a couple of things that I've been tracking. One might make a big difference to desktop users and that is uh, NVIDIA. Uh, the, the company that, uh, you know, famously got Torvald's ire back a few years ago and that that great clip from a, a talk he gave to, I think, a university somewhere anyway, um, it has announced, this has been a few months back, a, an open source kernel driver. They're finally throwing some code for their desktop GPUs eventually into the kernel. Uh, what's the what's the status of that? Are, did, did you guys' minds explode when that happened like the rest of us? And what, where's that at now? That is not a GPU driver like you think of a GPU driver. Let's just say that. <laughs> that is the GPU driver you use on in the cloud. So GPUs in the cloud for AI stuff is huge, right? Huge market, huge number of stuff. Um, you have to have open drivers on there because vendors enforce it. So mm -hmm. NVIDIA is wonderful in that they don't make, they don't break the GPL, they force you to break the GPL. <laughs> the way that, that's just the way the, the code is set up. So. 
um, vendors who are not willing to break the GPL ask for an open version that they can put in their render farms. That's the open version that they can put in the render farms. So it's great. So, I mean, that's nice. Um, wonderful. That works out great. But I mean, I, I mean, people love NVIDIA for graphics stuff, but I mean, I've been using a, AMD's graphics stuff wonderfully. Steam Deck, that's Linux gaming. Wonderful mm -hmm. stuff. AMD, great little chip, great, a great little device. I mean, it works one, great. I, I don't know. Just don't buy NVIDIA if you don't want to mess with the drivers. It's that simple. <laughs> It's, I mean, it's just I mean, like, I, don't buy a certain vendor of a mouse that you know doesn't work. It's just the same thing. <laughs> so, um, and NVIDIA has another half of the company that does tons of open source work. Their yeah. embedded chips are all up, upstream. They have a ton of really good engineers that work with the community, strong stuff. It's just, I mean, it costs money to keep code out of the kernel. NVIDIA has decided to spend that money to keep the code out of the kernel. And now maybe they're not. It's a business decision on their part. Yeah, and that's a valid point. <clears throat> some of us, th there's this temptation to go down the road of making some of these open source things moral issues. And I guess in some cases there are, but for the for the most case, that's that's not really the right way to look at this, is it? It's it's a it's a business decision. It's about economics more than more than morality. And uh, that's probably something you guys have to remind yourselves about from time to time, eh? Well, there's legal issues involved, of course, right? I mean, let's yeah. not get uh, legal issues. But again, Nvidia on their own, do not break the GPL. So they're not, they're abiding by the license. It's fine. They force you to break the GPL. <laughs> so um, <laughs> you can talk about intent and all the fun stuff like that. So um, yes, there are moral issues if you want to decry, go down the moral issue path. But I mean, it's just, it's just, let's talk about the technical issues here involved. So um, technically it's a pain in the butt to get that thing to work. So, <laughs> and it's a business decision. It's cheaper. I mean, IBM and Intel said years ago, I think there's some Harvard Business School review of it. It's cheaper to get your code, work with the community, get it upstream and have it maintained there than it is to keep it out of the tree. It's a business case to get it up the stream. Some companies make the business case they're willing to spend the money. Qualcomm infamously spends the money to keep it out of the tree until the very last possible moment because they want to hold off <laughs> in the way they do their releases. But then they do upstream and eventually it costs them a little bit more money. They're willing to spend it. That's fine. It's a business decision. Uh, speaking of technical things, we actually had a question from the chat room, and this is this is interesting. Uh, with AMD's announcement of their epic uh, their epic Genoa CPU tomorrow, which is potentially up to ninety six cores per CPU, is the thread scheduler in the kernel optimized for ninety six plus cores per CPU, and maybe up to one twenty eight for the next chip? Yeah, I mean, I'm getting bug reports of issues when we're hitting. 4,000 and 5,000 right now. So we've been, we've been, we've been, and, and that's in some really weird conditions. Yeah. We've been scaling that big for a long, long time. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's, that's nothing small. That's, that's not a big deal. So I think my system has more than that right now or pretty close to that. Um, yeah, that's not a big deal. There's a curve on how well they scale after a certain point in time, but that's, I mean, that's Linux's big success is we had access to the algorithms that we're allowed to do scaling well. And that's why we succeeded in the end, because we could do multiprocessor really, really well. And the only other person that could do that was Windows. And we kind of beat them on most of the stuff. Um, the other people didn't have access to the ability to take advantage of those algorithms, which was kind of interesting, maybe not fair, but it's how we won at the data centers. So uh, let me take this time to have a little break so I can let our listeners and viewers know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Code Comments, an original podcast from Red Hat. Uh, you know, when you're working on a project and you leave behind a small reminder in the code, a code comment to help others learn from your work, they'll, this podcast takes that idea by letting you listen in on two experienced technologists as they describe their building process. There's a lot of work required to bring a project from whiteboard to development, and none of us can do it alone. The host, Burr Sutter, is a Red Hatter and lifelong developer advocate and community organizer. In each episode, Burr sits down with experienced technologists from across the industry to trade stories and talk about what they've learned from their experiences. And by the way, I listened to uh, their first podcast, which is all about AI and ML, especially in the um, in the enterprise uh, space, and they 
actually don't do everything inside a Red Hat. They went to Intel in this case to talk to people about what they were doing with uh, open source and uh, and artificial intelligence and the rest of it. Good show. So episodes are available anywhere you listen to podcasts and at redhat.com slash code comments podcast. That's all one word, code comments podcast, redhat.com slash code comments podcast. Search for code comments in your podcast player. We'll also include a link in the show notes. My thanks to code comments for their support. So Catherine, I know you had from our back channel, <laughs> you had a question queued up. I watched a talk that you gave a while back about trust and the process of Linux kernel development and, and the processes you go for, go through. And I think probably most people listening have some vague idea of the process and that your patches um, are still come over email, which I thought was interesting. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about why email is still the best option for the Linux kernel. Um, and, and I, and actually, I, you know, I wondered if you could speak a little bit about this idea of trust and why the process is trustworthy, because obviously it is, I mean, it's everywhere, but, but the, I, I found um, the conversation around that pretty interesting. Sure. I'll talk about, um, I get a lot of flack for this, but email actually is the lowest <laughs> common denominator that everybody in the world has access to. It's that simple. Um, it's also really, really good when English is not your native language. And we want to have people with English is not their native language contributing. And as someone who lives in another country, it's, take, it's good to read a language, text in another language, process it, take the time to do it back. I know some open source projects want IRC, face-to-face -face meetings and whatnot. And that puts that at a huge disadvantage for people that aren't don't know English really, really well. So great. English, our email, lowest common denominator, works everywhere, works for everyone, um, works remotely, um, store and forward, works everywhere else. We have one of our core security people lives in somewhere in the middle of Africa. I don't really know where. I think he moved countries and he was doing store and forward and it worked really great and nobody really realized where he was. Um, it works great. And also plain text, HTML or no HTML. Email works great. It also provides a really good way to prove who you are. You can sign. We sign our patches and you can see any patch that I send out. It's cryptographically authenticated. I can verify that it comes from you. Um, we've actually had some cases where people spoof what company they're working for. And we've caught that because it's like, oh, well, no, you obviously are not coming from so and so.com because your email says it's not coming from that. that. So it's easy to detect that, things like that. And then usually that's the, oh, our IT department doesn't work. We had to use Gmail, which is almost always the case. <laughs> so um, all, the, all the Linux companies usually have a Linux box in the corner so they can go around the Exchange server. Even Microsoft, who's a big contributor to Linux, has a Linux box in the corner. So it doesn't hit the Exchange server and they can send their patches out. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it, it, email it works out really well. Um, the trust issue is interesting. Um, I have a friend who um, contributed to the kernel a while back and he was like, he said uh, it was terrifying the first time he contributed to the kernel because all of a sudden the work that he's putting out there is going to be viewed by the world with his name on it, right? And that's a good thing because you do really good work when your name is on something. You can't hide anonymously behind something. And you do better work because it's out there for everybody to see. And it's fine if you do things wrong, you get things buggy and whatnot. I mean, I joke, I've probably written more bugs than anybody else. Um, and that's that's true. So. Um, as long as you acknowledge your mistakes and learn from it and go forward, and that's great. But you're out there in the world contributing with your name. As far as trust goes, I mean, we had the problem where the University of Minnesota tried to submit some patches anonymously and claimed that they were sending false or buggy, known buggy patches to us. And they wrote a paper up and said that we accepted them. It turns out we didn't accept them. And they accepted one of the patches, but because their patch that they tried to write was buggy, was actually correct. <laughs> so um, they really didn't do a good job about that. Um, the ethics people ripped them, really, really got mad about that because they lied in their paper what they had done. Um, they lied to us. They, when they were caught, it was a whole big nightmare. And the big thing that I, we take can take from that is open source software is more trustworthy, not necessarily because it's written better, but because you can go back in time and audit it. So what we did is we looked at all the contributions that that university had ever contributed to the kernel for forever. 
and we audited everything. I had a whole bunch of interns at the moment, so we just let them loose and we audited everything we had. And it turns out they didn't really, they weren't that good of developers at the time. So we ripped all their old stuff out, fixed up the bugs and pushed out new updates. So you can't really do that with closed source stuff because you can't go back in time and see who contributed what, where it came from and change it and see how that works. Um, so since then we've worked with the university and they're, they have a, a very core kernel developer working with them to try and fix their procedures and how they work together and how they work in the community and teach them how to do things. But another thing that came out of that was everybody was like, oh no, you need to have verification of who's contributing to the kernel. Who's all the, who's doing all this work? Who's, who's doing all this crazy stuff? And the question is why? Why do we need that? Because your name's on there. We're not, we don't take anonymous things, known anonymous things. Um, and they're like, oh, well, we can't have people sneaking things in, sneaking bugs in. It's like, well, you do realize who writes the most bugs. Like, no, no, who writes the most bugs? I'm like, your core developers write the most bugs. <laughs> so, yeah. um, literally, it's a, just a matter of the odds. I mean, X, you say you write one, <laughs> one out of 10 changes is bad, right? So we're all human. So if I write a thousand changes, I wrote more bugs than somebody who just contributed two changes, right? Um, so the people you need to worry about the most are your core developers. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to put processes in place to catch everybody, all the bugs. So I want my, I want our testing tools and processes and infrastructure to catch all the bugs that I write because infamously I have written some pretty bad security bugs over the years um, <laughs> and fixed them later, yeah, but it's, it's just the way it, it goes. We're all human. Um, so I want you to catch my bugs. I want our tools to catch our bugs. And if they're going to catch the bugs of the core developers, they'll catch the bugs that are submitted from any developer. And that's the key. You need to have the tooling and the infrastructure in place in order to catch the problems that anybody can create because we're all human. So and we're all gonna make mistakes. So just do that and then you're okay. And a lot of a lot of open source projects have that, which is key. And that's all you really need to know. You don't need to know, verify who is doing what because your core people are the ones doing the most problems. <laughs> So I, I have a question, something I've, I've wondered about for a while now that I think tags well onto this. And that's the, the work with Asahi Linux, uh, putting Linux on the Apple M1, which is really cool, by the way. We've, we've been following that and think that's great work. One of their developers is uh, obviously writing under a pseudonym, Asahi Lena, working as a VTuber, which is cool. Um, I'm just curious, how is that going to work when there is a patch sent into the kernel from Asahi? as some, someone that's obviously working under a pseudonym, is this going to uh, cause some issues with the, the kernel's real name policy? Um, the only patches that I've accepted for that kind of hardware have come in with a real name. So look and see who's actually submitted the patches. Okay, that's, that's, that, is a, <laughs> that is a fair so, answer. Um, um, and, I don't know. I, I can go back and audit. I, I'll go back and audit and, and look. But um, that being said, we do have a few contributors. Um, there are some exceptions that we do know who they are. Um, mm -hmm. They just, for legal reasons, we know who they are. They have to use a certain name. The best is, I, I mean, infamously, I ask everybody who, when they contribute to the kernel, who they work for, right? And hilariously about once a year i guess somebody's saying oh i work for this company but don't tell anybody because we're not allowed to contribute to the kernel and oh by the way i'm the person in charge of that policy it's like what <laughs> um so we have a few people like that that's an interesting one um, we, we um, get that a lot um so anyway goodness okay well that that answers that pretty nicely uh if i've still got the ball i want to ask about rust uh this, this yeah. is another <laughs> thing that i'm pretty excited about yeah uh, so there are uh, apparently two very polarized opinions on this. I've seen a few people claiming that this will be the death of the kernel. And uh, then the rest of us are pretty excited about the potential. And uh, I don't know, are you somewhere in the middle or, or are you on, on one team or the other? <laughs> I'm in the middle, right? I have the rest book back there. I need to learn it some better. Um, I'm in the middle. Um, the way, I mean, Jonathan Corbett talked about this on your own podcast a couple of weeks ago, right? And he gave a really good description of it. Rust. <laughs> And Linux is going to be unique and different from Rust and user space mm -hmm. because our environment is very, very different. We have a very constrained environment, lots of different, <laughs> different problems. So Rust traditionally, when it causes, when you detect the problem, it will just kill the program. Well, you can't do that when you're in a kernel. So you have to have some bounds in place. Um, there's some good things that we do in Linux that would be Rust would be nice to like writing parsers to parse USB devices. Uh, descriptors and things like that. That would have been cool. Um, and everybody said, oh, we'll just use Rust to write a driver. 
Um, people don't realize that drivers actually consume the whole kernel, right? They consume resources from everything. They're the, the tip of the leaf and they do everything. They need memory management, they need timers, they need schedulers, they need, that. They need everything. So you have to write bindings between Rust and C for all of the interfaces, right? And that's gonna be a lot of work over time. Um, it's cool, I, I like it, I like the idea, and it'll solve a certain subset of the problems that we have in C. And there's some areas that it'll prevent from ever happening because it just won't allow it to happen. That being said, there is a mismatch between how the kernel handles things like objects and devices and how Rust handles things like objects and devices. And meshing those two is an interesting, Interesting thing. I've had a lot of discussion with the Rust developers. I think we can come to some good solutions. But even if we were to stop today, the work that the Rust developers have caused us to reevaluate and think about has actually benefited in the C side of the kernel. I've made changes to the core driver model to benefit the Rust people that have benefited everybody to prevent things from happening and being done wrong. So having new ideas and, and models that are coming in from the Rust developer community is great. It helps everybody out their way. Um, I, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Um, it's in the kernel today. It does a hello world and that's it. There's some great examples of some uh, of drivers out there um, on how to, where to go forward with this. We have people doing file systems in there when file systems might be like the sweet spot for doing in Rust um, because there's some cool things you can do. File systems do not consume much of anything from the kernel as far as resources go. So um, you can write a small binding layer and away they go. Uh, they can do some cool things. Um, it'll be interesting to see, and it's fun. I mean, it's a fun thing to do. And that's, in the end, we're all engineers, we're cool progr we're programmers, we like having, playing with cool toys and fun things, and let's do that. And remember, some of the core Rust developers are longtime Linux kernel developers. So they know our environment. They came from our environment. So they know our issues and evolved, and that'll help, that's helped Rust the language out by providing yes. interfaces and cool things that so it's a great synergy and it's fun. So why not? Let's see what happens. Yeah. So you, you point out that rust in user space is much different than rust in kernel space. And I just have to say in fairness, C in user space is way different from C in kernel space too. That's true. I mean, it, we are very restricted in what you can do in the kernel. C in the kernel is very simple. I mean, the kernel code is overall very simple because we have to do everything ourselves. So we do everything ourselves and we do it in very tiny, tight, constrained ways. And you can't really do things wrong that way. So Rust is, is turning out to be the same idea. There's a lot of things, fancy things you can do in Rust that you're not gonna be able to do in the kernel. Like people are like, oh, we wanna have cargo and import all these different things. I'm like, no, that's just not even gonna work. <laughs> Don't even do that. I have a meeting with some people at Google and I think after this later tonight uh, to talk about that. <laughs> no, that's not how this is gonna work. Um, but for the most part, the people working on the Rust code in Linux kernel know what they're doing. They're really smart people. They're brilliant people. And in fact, what the work that they've done, and I'm encouraged. And if nothing else, again, it's helped us out. So that's the best thing to do. And it, it's made people excited. And we always like people being excited about kernel development. Okay, so, so I actually have a, a, a question, which is um, about it, it seems like every few months, somebody with a podium, uh, one recently is somebody who used to write for Linux Journal, comes out and says, oh, the Linux Foundation is funded by all these giant companies, and therefore, it must have, those companies must have some influence on Linux. There's always, money always corrupts, corrupts absolutely and all those things. And, and you've actually tackled this question like every 10 years or so in the past. As I, I, I tackle it every couple of months when somebody asks me this, and I, I laugh because, all right, so Linux Foundation is, is a trade organization because legally it has to be a trade organization, right? For yeah. companies to come together and work on a, on a project together, they can't unless they do an auspicious of a trade organization. Otherwise, it runs into anti-monopolistic laws. So legally, they have to do this, right? If HP and IBM want to talk about a networking issues, they can't unless they do it in a trade organization. So the Linux Foundation provides that. That being said, nobody, I mean, anybody who says that doesn't actually understand how Linux is developed. I mean, look at John Corbett and I do the numbers every couple months. Um, and he writes, I do the database, he, do, he writes the articles. Um, what are we, um, it's, it's all these different companies. We have 500 companies last year that contributed to the kernel. Um, Linux Foundation only pays for three kernel developers. You know, Linus, me, and Shua. 
Um, and our contracts say they can't tell us what to do and we can't tell them what to do. So, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty simple. I mean, we have enough other work to do, but I mean, we're just three people reading code and stuff from other people. We're not doing much on our own. Um, everybody contributes to Linux in a selfish way, given that. So everybody contributes to solve a problem that they have. The fun part is everybody has the same problems. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> ter- I mean, famously, I mean, I give this, ta- this, this example all the time. Years and years ago, the embedded people came to us and said, oh, power management's really important. We want to run Linux on devices with batteries. Here's the special ways to do this. We're going to add these special hooks and stuff. And we're like, no, why don't you make a generic, make it work for everybody? They're like, ah, oh, that's too much work. Nobody cares. I'm like, we're like, do it right for everybody. So they went back, did the work right. And now data centers save billions of dollars in money because power management matters for servers. <laughs> so <laughs> everybody has the same problems. They just don't realize it. So as far as corporate influence goes, I mean, like John and I have said, we're like 10% of the kernel contr- contribution happens from people not associated with a company. And that's only because they haven't been hired yet. Um, somebody at the plumbers conference, I used to joke five patches and you get a job. Um, somebody gave a talk and said, no, it took me 20 patches before I got a job. <laughs> um, so if you get a job, it works out great. We have an intern program that's packed. We have like 200 people apply for 10 slots. Um, everybody that goes through that either gets a job or they stay in academia or they decide not to do it. Um, it's so if you get a job, if you do this type of work, you'll get a job. There's so many jobs out there. That being said, we have tons of people, more people are doing kernel development now than ever have been doing kernel development in the world. So it's really nice. 4,000 people a year. Um, I don't think the world's ever seen that many kernel people. (laughs) (laughs) And I I remember, yeah, I I just want to finish this thought a a little bit because um, I remember when uh, Dan Fry, when he was at IBM told me it took, IBM six years to realize they couldn't tell their kernel developers what to do. That in fact, it was more like the other way around. And then, uh, and then Andrew Morton said, everybody working for the kernel has to work for everybody. How can you possibly be working for one company when you're working for everybody? So, and, and that, and that's sort of, so I just have a little question about that. How is it possible to, to do something that is for everybody? But it seems to have been, you know, the, the early thing we talked about embedded earlier, and real time, I don't know if you touched real time exactly, but it was, oh, no, they can't do real time. You can't, there are all these things the Linux kernel can't do, then it ends up doing it anyway. And I think it's because you need it for everybody. Maybe that's why it's, you know, it, it won 10 years ago. Well, it's also interesting because everybody has a problem. They're like, oh, I'm not gonna write a whole operating system, but if I change this little tiny thing, it'll work for me. And we say, go make that ch- little tiny thing be generic enough to work for everybody. And they do, it saves them time and money to do that. They get a solution. And away they go. I mean, yeah, Linux has been real time in John Deere tractors and IKEA laser welding robots and Volkswagen assembly lines for decades now. Um, so, I mean, it's it, it solves a problem because it, you just have to put a little bit of effort into it, solve your problem, and it happens to work for everybody. Um, and it saves you time and money to work upstream. I mean, infamously, Linux drivers are one third the size of operating other operating system drivers because we can see and help you and review this stuff. We have experience. I mean, people, people make fun of us for, oh, you've been doing this for so long. It's like, well, do you, don't you want people with lots and lots of experience doing this type of stuff? Um, I mean, the networking developer, he's been doing networking core stuff for 25 years. I've been doing USB for 25 years. Um, that's good, right? I mean, the other operating systems, a company, you traditionally move around from different divisions to do this. With us, if you're a maintainer of something, you get stuck doing it for forever. Um, and IBM, I, was, I worked for Dan Fry for a while. We learned out the hard way. We had somebody, a new graduate come in and he took over a portion of the kernel and he was a maintainer of a certain timer subsystem and whatnot. And then he was, he finished his job that he was assigned to IBM and he was going to work on something else. So we're like, no, you have to still give him time to be the maintainer. And they're like, what, what? I'm like, yeah, he's the maintainer of that. And that person is taking that position with him to other, other companies, right? It doesn't follow, stay at the company, it stays with the person. And that's a really important thing because there's a lot of good depths of knowledge in people and we can learn and teach other people and whatnot and it just doesn't disappear. Linux has a really, really deep history of knowledge, which is awesome. And we've gotten people from other operating systems. There's a lot of ex Microsoft people working on Linux, which is great. Um, when I was at Novell, I wanted the network people and they weren't really around that much, but we had a few network people working on Linux and that's all good. I mean, we want that history and that, that depth of knowledge there. Okay, Catherine has a question queued up, but first I'll have to 
let everybody know this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. The challenge with device security has always been that it's difficult to scale. The bigger you are, the more edge cases you introduce, and the easier it is for significant issues to escape your notice. When remote work took over, the challenge got exponentially harder. Whether you're in a fast-growing startup that needs to graduate from managing device inventory in Google Sheets or an enterprise trying to speed up service desk issues, you need visibility into your fleet of devices in order to meet security goals and keep everything running smoothly. But how do you achieve that visibility when your design team uses Macs, accounting is on Windows, and your most talented developers are on Linux? You get Collide. Collide is an endpoint security solution that gives IT teams a single dashboard for all their devices, regardless of their operating system. Collide can answer questions MDMs can't. Questions like, do you have production data being stored on devices? Are all your developers SSH keys encrypted? And a host of other data points that you'd have to write a custom shell script in order to learn about. Think about it. If a Linux vulnerability is exposed tomorrow, how do you figure out how many machines are at risk? File a ticket with the team that manages your MDM and wait days to get a report back. Send a mass email and hope the Linux users open it. With Collide, you have real-time access to your fleet's data. And instead of installing intrusive agents or locking down devices, Collide takes a user-focused approach that communicates security recommendations to your employees directly on Slack. You can answer every question you have about your fleet without intruding on your workforce. Visit collide.com slash floss to find out how. If you follow that link, they'll hook you up with a goodie bag, including a t-shirt just for activating a free trial. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash floss. Okay, Catherine, <laughs> your turn. So picking up a thread actually uh, from Doc earlier about corporate participation in open source projects. Um, and actually kind of ties into the the email uh, verification and identity verification a little bit because or at least in my mind it does but there is a there is an emphasis a lot on uh crediting systems in open source projects i i come from a drupal perspective you know there's a very intricate system of tracking where contributions come from and i i appreciate the value of having been lucky enough to be one of the people paid to contribute so my company name you know went along with my contributions and um I just wondered how you felt about these type of corporate ranking systems. Everybody wants to be at the top of, of uh, you know, listed contributions for whatever project, especially something like Linux. And and I wonder, you know, what you thought about them and and what's the right way to do it and what, you know, what people are, are doing right and wrong in, in that arena. I think I'm the one who caused all that to happen. So I'm sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> about well, 18, 18 to 20 years ago, I gave a talk that I, I showed who was contributing to the kernel and what who they worked for, what companies contributed. And ever since then, we've had to do a report showing who is actually contributing and who is sponsoring them. Yes. Um, so it, it's an interesting um, thing. Um, that being said, I mean, yeah, we all work for we work for somebody. We help them do what the company wants. Um, but like, as John Corbett said, we need more maintainers to review stuff. But we also track who's doing the reviewing as well. Um, but it's good. I mean, and the numbers are so large that you really can't game them. It's kind of fun to watch when companies try to game them, right? Um, that being said, even if you're trying to game them with, um, oh, I'm just going to submit a whole bunch of spelling fixes or code up, clean up coding style fixes. Well, well, that's good. We want those. So those are valid contributions. Yeah. <laughs> so um, inadvertently, if you look at our top 10 contributors every year, there's a, like two or three or four people that are doing really good janitorial work. They're sweeping the tree and they're cleaning up old crufty stuff. They're picking up old patterns. They're deleting drivers that don't aren't even being used because nobody has the hardware anymore. They're doing other stuff. And that's good. That's you need that for the lifeblood of your project. So if you're trying to think that, oh, companies are going to game it, I'll take it because those are contributions. You want contributions, right? right. Um, we are lucky in the kernel that we have a ton of participation and a ton of contributions. Any other open source project would be so lucky to have what we have. Um, so we don't turn things away, but we're, we're very welcoming and we accept them, but everybody wants help, right? So if you're going to send spelling fixes to Kubernetes, they'll be glad to take it. Um, more power to you. And then the interesting thing is that's how you learn the code base and you learn the development process. We have a whole portion of the kernel that 
we encourage people just to do coding style fixes and cleanups because then you learn the process, you learn how things get involved and then you mm -hmm. tri trip over something and you're like, oh, wait, I can really go fix this for real. And then you go off and stumble into another part of the kernel and become a subsystem maintainer. We have a load of people who've done that over the years and it's a good like little bait and hook or way to get into the kernel. So by doing that type of effort, and it's important to give recognition to companies that are sponsoring open source work because it's good stuff. And it's also on the other way, I mean, infamously, I gave a talk at Intel years and years ago showing how nobody contributed at Intel to the kernel except for uh, specifically one person who was somebody's manager. <laughs> and, and he got to say, hey, guys, if I can do this, you can do this. And infamously also in Japan, another company, a manager, a higher up manager at, at Japan in a very large company, got a, it translated the documentation into Japanese and became the maintainer of that. And then he went to his engineers and said, if I can do this, why aren't you doing this? Um, so it was actually a really good a good stick to show that um, people, other people are doing things and everybody should be able to contribute. And also it's interesting, some companies don't realize that they're really contributing to the kernel at all when they are. So I gave a talk that's online saying, here's all these people at Google, they're doing this work. And people are like, who are these people? So um, that was an interesting thing too. So. Well, All right, I've got to jump in like and ask a couple of questions that Catherine maybe can't because they're Intel related. <laughs> and then I've got kind of a third <laughs> meta question about yes, that. I, um, hashtag I am so, Intel. She's an employee. <laughs> she's a, I am an Intel employee. employee. Had a, if I had not mentioned that already, yes. Plug away, yes, there, there, there's your. I'm there's not an Intel stuff. employee, but they owe me a lot of liquor for all the security bugs. So. <laughs> I, hey, you know, next time I see you, I'll happily buy you. <laughs> <laughs> or wine. I like wine. I don't know. Wine's good too. I'll take that. Uh, so first off, uh, the 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 performance and efficiency cores from the latest uh, Intel CPUs. Um, how much of a headache has that been? And and this may be a dumb question, but why was that not easier? Because we already have big dot little over an ARM. <laughs> um, first off, I'm not a scheduler person. I am not okay. a scheduler person at all. Um, that is not my area. I do drivers, little tiny things over the side and make your mouse work, things like that. Um, keep your serial port alive. That's been alive for forever. Um, <laughs> Big Little is scary. Big Little is a nightmare. And if you look at what Intel did with their cores, it isn't the same as Big Little. Um, it looks a little different. That being said, ARM is coming out with cores that are like a 32 and a 64 bit core on the same chip. And we're supposed to migrate between them. Talk about a scheduling nightmare. Um, <laughs> the things that Intel did was kind of like that. They were radically different cores from what I remember. I could be totally wrong. And it just took more logic. It took a lot more work and a lot more effort to do this type of stuff in a way that will work for everybody. Remember, we're a general purpose operating system. We have to have something that works and a scheduler that works for everybody. And that's a hard thing to do to tune, to process and make things work well over time. Big little took us a long time to get working right mostly because the hardware didn't work very well. Um, the first three couple of rounds of Big Little made no sense at all because you all the power was in the RAM. So it kept all the power to keep the RAM shutting off a big core, saved no power at all. Um, turns out CPU designers don't talk to the RAM designers. Anyway, um, um, that being said, so the Intel stuff, I'm, I've, what I know of, it's just, it's a radically different design. So it just took a while to get there. And okay. It's getting there, um, but it, it's getting better. So. Oh yes, no. We, we've been we've been following that story too. You know, the, the, okay, the new Intel CPUs they'll work under Linux, but maybe wait for a couple more kernel releases before they get really good. So I, I want to I want to go to something else that I've been following. We're running out of time, so I'm going to go through these real quick. Something else that I've been following, and that is the actual real time patches. And of course, that's being done by Linux Tronics, who got bought by Intel, which actually way to go Intel because Linux Tronics was having a funding problem, and so Intel kind of as far as we can tell from the outside, kind of scooped in and saved the day to keep those things going. Um, I saw a comment from Linus on one of these, one of these threads that essentially said, well, there's, there's not very many people that care about this. And it's only for, you know, these, these very, very specific instances. And I'm over here going, wait a second. I do, I do audio like musician work on Linux. I care about trying to get low latencies. Want the real time patches help with that. And so I'm curious, no, and I know there's a no, bunch of driver things. No, they won't. This. They, they don't. They don't. They don't help with that. Remember, real time is not low latency. Real time is deterministic latency. So yes. it can be really so, slow determinism. <laughs> so it's not low latency. 
<laughs> when 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 you tune your audio interface though for really low latency, one of the problems that we see is most of the time it can handle that, but every once in a while you'll have an X run. And so I've always seen the audio guy saying, well, if you can actually go into a real time mode, you can prevent those X runs because you know that the kernel is going to be ready for each of those packets. Yes, and, and you can do that. And that, that is a good thing. If you can to tune that thing to say you cannot overrun this type of stuff, then yes, it will. But Real, remember, real time on its own doesn't guarantee latency issues. Now, sure. if your system it can handle the guarantee that it will give you that, most audit consumer his, um, hardware can't because, like the, the <laughs> CPU, SMP, um, MSI. There's some other crazy stuff underneath the CPU that takes it away from Linux, and we have no idea it's even gone and comes back. But um, there's some really cool things you can do with Linux. Um, now you can take Linux off all the CPU or off a CPU and then run all your audio stuff on just that CPU. So then you don't even have Linux involved. And I know a number of people do that. But real time, I mean, traditionally laser welding robots, um, very, very like John Deere tractors. There's some things where latency really, really matters. Um, yeah. Audio, most consumer hardware can do audio. I have a Raspberry Pi that I can do massively fun audio stuff with perfect, no, just a normal kernel. Muse has their guitar that they play in concert has a Raspberry Pi inside it, running Linux to do a audio uh, uh, um, MPI interface out. No real time kernel new. Um, the giant systems with the sound and the things like that with audio, those are not using the real time kernel. But that being said, the real time kernel is cool. Um, I'm really happy about it. It's cleaning up a lot of problems that we've had in Linux over the years. Um, and it's almost done, it's almost done. Okay, so I've I've got to ask kind of a, a meta question about those two because those those have been two things that have been well and all all the rest of the questions I've asked on the show really have been kind of like burning questions and sometimes I've had comments or thoughts about things that have happened on the mailing list and I've always had this thought of I'm just an outsider and this is probably a dumb comment I'm not going to send this into the mailing list is there a way or a place that kind of these outsider comments make sense? to as feedback or as questions is is there a way that that we should be handling these or do you, do you prefer for kind of a the the and I, I will put myself in this category the uninformed observer should we just kind of stay out of the way unless we have a patch to submit like where, where's the the balance on that well if you have a problem let us know i mean that, that, that's being said if you have a bug and you see a bug in the latest version of kernel let us know. We're more than willing to help you fix with that. Um, that being said, if you have a problem that isn't addressed, let us know. But I mean, things like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if this did this? No, that's not gonna really bad because my to-do list is huge. We, we need patches coming in. Um, but I mean, even the audio people, we deal with a lot of audio, like there's a whole bunch of audio routing products and synthesizers and stuff. And those have run with a stock Linux kernel today. There's open source projects that do that. We, inter we interface with them a few times. There are a number of kernel developers working for those companies that contribute to the kernel. So um, especially in the audio area, I just got an email from some audio company in Germany that wants a driver for one of their devices. Um, so they're out there and they, they contribute to Linux and they do good stuff. So um, work through that. If you have hardware that doesn't work, let us know. If you have a bug that doesn't know, but just to speak up saying, oh yes, I really do care about real time. Well, maybe you don't and you don't realize it. Like I've tried <laughs> to help explain here, or it just doesn't matter to you. So it, it doesn't, that's not going to that's not going to help get a patch accepted. Now, if you tested a patch, wonderful. If you said, hey, this solves my problem for me, I would love, 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 love for that to be there. You can put your name on it. I would love to have a path of blame in case something goes wrong. Um, but that's that's <laughs> perfect. And, but I mean, because we don't have all the hardware to test stuff. If you test something for me, that's that makes my life much, much easier as, as a reviewer. Yeah. And that's the best way to get involved. Just start reading changes from other people. When you learn music, you don't start writing music before you read music, right? Yeah. And same thing with programming. You should read lots of code before you start writing code. It's not really taught that way, but it's really, really helpful that way. So start reading changes coming in by people and just ask questions. If you have a question saying, why did you do it this way? I, everybody has to justify their changes, right? There's no reason why. I, I would not get upset if somebody said, why are you doing this way? I'm like, oh, because of this. And maybe I didn't document it good enough because it wasn't obvious. And that's fine. Sure. You know, it's funny to talk about um, real time. Uh, I remember we bought this new Sony television in 2006 for our then new house. And and it comes, it came with a thing that said, this is, there's Linux in here and we, our lawyers are making us show you the entire GPL. So there was like a five page <laughs> thing. 
And it so didn't flatter <laughs> flatter looks because you could go out and have a smoke or mix a drink or something while you're waiting for this TV to come up. And I remember thinking, can I go in and fix this thing? Apparently I couldn't. So I guess that's... <laughs> <laughs> that, They've gotten better. It's but, usually in the box now. It's a little link somewhere buried in there. I mean, look what Android does. It, it, the GPL is in there. You just, yeah. It's provided. It's not shoved in front of your face. There's a lot of been a lot of people were worried about that to start with. So I mean, it was nice that they were erring on the side of we want you to know and be, <laughs> they want to follow the license explicitly, which was great. I really appreciate that. Sony is one of the people that have done the right thing for so long. They're really, really good at that. Linux has been in their cameras for forever. Um, they did some really cool stuff with power management. They just shut off the whole kernel and started back up again, right where it was, really fast. And they do cool things like that. Um, yeah. I didn't know that. So, so this this is my new Sony uh, A7 IV camera. There's Linux in here. That's cool. If I don't know which true. ones have it, but there are a, yeah. I, some Sony kernel one. developers that, that do have it. It might be. It might not. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We're probably close report, to running out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, I want to ask a. Uh, the diversity question, which is, it may be unanswerable, you know, uh, there, I mean, Linux Journal itself had, was for a while entirely staffed by women while the readership was 100% male. Um, and we, there's nothing we could do about that. And I don't know whether, I, it seems to be the way Linux kernel development works is, is basically just who shows up. But have you thought much or talked much among yourselves or alpha maintainers and so forth about about getting more women and other folks uh, involved? Yes, we talk about this all the time. And we've talked about this for years. Um, I know John Corbett talked about this as well. I mean, we are at the mercy of the end of the supply chain, right? <laughs> so there's not much we can do, but there's work we can do to feed the top of the supply chain. So we do a lot there. Um, we have produced even a report saying, at our best guess, here is what our numbers are. And it looks like we are even better than Python. I mean, Python's pretty good as far as contributions. So we're a little bit above the corporate average on contributions. It's hard to guess what we are. On that being said, we have we work with Outreachy, we work with um, another Linux Foundation intern project. Uh, we work with another couple, um, Google Summer of Code. Um, we get lots and lots of interns in. And the big problem, well, it's a problem, is that these people go through the intern project and then they get hired. And that helps them a lot because then they're off and they get a better job and they do really good work and they are off in other companies. And sometimes those companies don't give them the chance to contribute back to the kernel, which is fine. That's up to them of what they want to do. But um, so we're helping the betterment for on individual level, whether we're helping the betterment for the project or level, if that's that might be a second additional bonus someday in the future or not, I'd rather take the first, you know help these people out. Um, some of the stories we have of people um, changing their lives because they've made it through the intern project of Outreach is just amazing. So if you go back and look and see what that's done. Um, and that's great. And I really encourage that and support that. I have been a mentor many, many for many, many years, been a mentor for Google Summer Code since the beginning and um, strongly encourage working with students. I work with, that's why I moved me to Europe. Uh, work with the university here in the Netherlands that they're the people that found Spectre Meltdown. They do really good systems work. It's the university where Tenenbaum's from, um, and it's all Linux, all everywhere in there. Um, one of their graduate students just spoke at the Plumbers um, Conference the other day, or a couple, about a month ago. Uh, so they're doing really good system level research with universities, students, and that's where you get involved. That's where you show them that kernel development is not some special scary thing, and everybody can do that. And then that hopefully will trickle down and do better. So we're basically at the end of the show where, uh, is there anything we haven't asked you yet that you'd like to answer in a short, in a short way? I can't think of anything. No, <laughs> always email me and ask me again, or have me on again. This yeah. is fun. <laughs> yeah, no, this is fun. I, 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 I wish we had an hour and a half or two hours. Um, yeah. the, uh, so we always answer and end this with, with two questions, which are um, this kind of our control questions. What are your favorite text editor and scripting language? Favorite text editor is v Vim, V-I-M. Um, yes. I've used it for forever. Um, I, that being said, university, I did learn Emacs and was used it there, but then I got into the real world and it was nowhere, but VI was everywhere. So I used that. <laughs> um, and then, um, I'm sorry, what was the second question? Oh, uh, text, uh, uh, scripting language. Scripting. Uh, I still have a fondness for Perl. 
<laughs> so um, I got insulted. I got insulted once by somebody at a company saying, you write Perl code like a C programmer. And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that being said, I do write. I do write some ba a lot of bash. Um, I have been forced to learn Python thanks to Constantine, our kernel.org sysadmin, who writes a lot of our helper scripts in Python, so helping him out. So um, I've slowly converted over to the dark side of Python, but I still rely on a bunch of Perl <laughs> stuff. <So. laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, well, well, Greg, it has been absolutely awesome having you on the show. Um, we should have had you on sooner. We'll have you on again because things will change. <laughs> and, sure. Glad to. And we, this didn't, is fun. and we didn't talk enough. This is great. This is, a, I think, possibly the fastest hour we've had, it seems. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> They're all about the same, but this is, this is faster. So thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. This was fun. I, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> great. So, guys, um, how, how was that for you? It was great. I, I, yeah, I think we could, we could talk for several hours. But uh, yeah, are we are we officially in the post show? I don't know. <laughs> I no, can't remember how well, this works. But, okay. Not yet. No, we're not. We're not in the. Okay. Okay. Are we um, in the post show? Yeah, no, was... we're not in the post show. Uh, where where are no, we? But I feel like I could ask. <laughs> we're the, we're the yeah, I don't, we do I don't the, know where we are. We do the plugs and then I talk about next week. Ah, and, the um, plugs. Of and course. say goodbye. Yes. So do your plugs while I see who's going on next week. <laughs> oh, okay. So. Well, I can I can do a plug. I um. Well, there's the first. There's there's our other podcast. Podcast. That's Reality 2.0. Uh, you can find us on podcast players everywhere. The other is uh, open.intel.com. I've started writing a few things there. Uh, you'll you'll see you'll see my name pop up more and more. I hope. And um, yeah, I just posted something about eBPF. And uh, yeah, watch that space. <laughs> All right. So that was a lot of fun to have have Greg on, and uh, we thank him for humoring our our questions. Some of them got very nerdy, but that's <laughs> that's part of the fun. I love that. That was uh, great. No, that's that's always that's always fun to talk to him, and it's always fun to get to talk to somebody you know in the know. And and like I said, there's some of these questions that it would be really weird to ask on the mailing list, but we 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 got him here just to ourselves for an hour and got to nerd out about them, and that was great. Yeah, it was it was, it was great having you on the show. Um, we, uh, I think I've only seen Greg at conferences. I was once talking to somebody who said, I didn't know you existed where there wasn't industrial flooring, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> that was the only place we, we ever met. Uh, uh, but I, I, you know, that, but it's great. It's great. It's great to have him on the show. He's always, always been fun to talk to. So, okay. So next week, a uh, lot more. yeah, I know we'll think of all kinds of questions later. Um, next week we have on Alex, Belokrilov, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right, Belokrilov. And I don't have the next thing that tells me what, what he does. But <laughs> trust me, anybody with a hard pronounced name is good to have on the show. So, so that's yeah. coming up next week. And uh, and until then, stay tuned. All right. hey, and uh, I, need to, I do need to jump in, Doc. I just got whispered into my ear. I've got an Ask Me Anything coming up on the 17th on the Club Twit Discord. So anyone that okay. has any burning questions for me, hopefully not too many gotchas, but we'll do those too. Uh, make sure to get them in and then catch that on the 17th. Uh, got to be part of Club Twit to get in on that. Uh, and then while you're there, make sure and check out the Untitled Linux Show, where we talk about the Linux news from the week. And that goes, uh, we, we do that live Saturday afternoons. Have a lot of fun there. Right. It's a, it's a great show, too. So, <laughs> okay, guys, thanks so much. Um, I'm Doc Searles. We will see you next week. Hey, folks, I'm Ant Pruitt. And I have a question for you. How do you think your hardworking team? With a Club Twit corporate subscription plan, of course. Show your appreciation and reward your tech team with a subscription to Club Twit. Keep everyone informed and entertained with podcasts covering the latest in tech. With the Club Twit subscription, they get access to all of our podcasts ad free. And they also get access to our members only Discord, uh, access to exclusive outtakes and behind the scenes footage, and special content like the fireside chats that I enjoy hosting. Plus, they also get shows like Hands on Mac, Hands on Windows, and the Untitled Linux Show. So, go to twit.tv slash clubtwit and look for corporate plans for complete details.